You are going to enjoy this uh, episode of the Business of Meeting podcast with Simon Bowen. It's absolutely unique what he has created. You will learn uh, how you can actually uh, position your pricing, uh, how you can differentiate yourself, and how you can use models to explain what you're doing to your customer and also to your team and to start building loyalty from the sales process on. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. I'm Eric Rosenberg and today I'm extremely happy to speak uh, with uh, an amazing man, uh, the founder of the uh, Models Method, uh, a true genius in communication and sales and uh, you, you're going to, I'm sure, enjoy the, this episode. Uh, Simon Bowen, live from Australia. Uh, good day, mate. <laughs> good day. How are you? Yeah, it's it's good to have you. It's morning for you. It's evening for me. And the first time yeah. I'm recording a, a podcast in the evening, by the way. So that's good. Good to see you. It's great to see you too again, Eric. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Simon, I had the pleasure of meeting you thanks to uh, Jason Gainyard. I, I don't know how many times I've said that in my life. And uh, with this podcast, there's a lot of people that I know <laughs> thanks to uh, to MMT. Uh, but I really, really, really love uh, what you're doing with the models and to, to ex, uh, explain the concept. Um, and, you know, a lot of uh, people and a lot of business owners in the meetings and even industry will always have this issue that people are wondering, what is it exactly that you're doing? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you help people with that. Um, but before we get into that and, uh, and those models, who's Simon Bowen? How, how did you start uh, and, and how did you... Uh, build up this this uh, models method to help people. Sure. So it's an interesting. I mean, it's an interesting question, and I think partly it's, it is just how my mind works. But um, you know, I grew up in really small country towns uh, in Western Australia, and when I say small, I mean nine hundred people. Oh, wow. um, and uh, you, you know, there's there's only a, a pub or a hotel in the town, and one room in the pub is the post office and the other one is the general store and then the rest is a hotel and, and a petrol station. And, it, you know, there's 2 million people in Western Australia and WA is half of the Australian continent. So we do a lot of driving on country roads. And so from the youngest age, you know, if someone said, oh, you know, go out to so-and-so's farm or whatever, someone would grab a stick and draw the map on the ground. You know, you go down this road, you pass the old... Uh, farm shed and you turn left and you know when I got my license if I was to drive to the city my father would draw me we call it a mud map in Australia would draw me a map of a road so you never went anywhere without uh, representing the journey as a model on paper a, a picture on paper first right mm -hmm. the more I think about it it sort of probably came from there but I spent my early working life in electrics and electronics and you can't see electricity, and um, you certainly can't see it through electronic componentry. Um, there's not even any moving parts in electronics. It's not like there's a relay or something like that. And so if you're going to design a circuit, the first thing you do is draw the circuit on paper. Uh, if you're going to repair a circuit, the first thing you do is look at the circuit on paper. And, in fact, most of the things that we do as humans um, have their, you know, when we have a thought, they have their first physical manifestation in the real world as a, a picture on paper, you know, a, a, a blueprint. Um, everything around me in this room was, first of all, a design on paper before it became reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that just, you know, that, that uh, and then I, then I, you know, out of that industry, I thought I'd be a teacher teaching physics and things like that, and you can't teach that without drawing it to people. So I think my brain just got tuned into the easiest way to explain complex ideas to people was to draw the idea on paper, uh, and then that that sort of evolved into specifically models on paper. I've always been a believer in the power of, of a model, and so one of the things I often say to people, you know, if you're going to buy an apartment from a developer, and the mm -hmm. apartment building isn't built yet, we buy it off the plan. And it's a totally acceptable thing to do. But we expect people, you know, when we're selling a complex product or service, something that's really clever that, that we offer, 
we expect people to buy it just because we say it's great. And what we're doing with the models is creating these blueprints for the brain that represent that complex idea so that people can buy your idea off the plan, off a model. They buy the, you know, someone goes and buys that apartment, they're actually buying the plan first, the floor plan. That's what they're paying for. They haven't even seen the apartment yet because it hasn't been built. So when you sell a complex product or service, you're a financial advisor, you're an accountant, you're a lawyer, you're a coach, you're a consultant, you know, and it's it's basically the the the, the, the product or service is basically your genius. You, you need to allow people to buy up the plan. So I think, you know, I think it really came from a, a mixture of, you know, having a teaching background, having worked in a technical area, um, having lived a life where, you, you know, most of the time anything that was complex that needed to be explained to me was always drawn first and then it just kind of became normal I mean I remember my father building things he was a great handyman you know and so there'd be these drawings all around the house of a wall cabinet that he was going to build and it'd be this hand drawing of this wall cabinet on paper like he never did anything without drawing it first and I guess it just became the way I think and then as I you know got you know as I developed in my business career it was the most natural way for me to sell and facilitate I've, I've got a, 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 a reputation in Australia for really successfully facilitating complex contentious things so for example you know they're going to build a 60,000 seat sports stadium I was uh, you know I I was hired to facilitate all the stakeholder engagement for that, the media groups, disability groups, sports fans, all the sporting codes, government to, you know, what do you all want in a stadium? And it was my job to facilitate all that and then bring all of that together into a brief that can be made available to architects to tender for the contract. You know, it's a billion-dollar project and, uh, you know, I just have a reputation for being able to get people in a room to a common place on something. You know, I, I did the statewide strategic plan for our wine industry and then the five-year export plan and the strategic plan for our two major cities and, you know, the, the global sales process for, for a, a, a ship building company. And the, my, my secret simply is if you've got 100 people in a room who don't agree on something. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> it never happens, get, right? <laughs> yeah, I get... <laughs> the government used to hire me. I do less of this work today because I really love working with entrepreneurs. But the government would say to me, we've got about 200 people who are at war with each other over a policy. But actually they're unified in the fact that they're at war with us. So <laughs> we're going to put them in a room <laughs> together and you've got a couple of hours to get them to reach agreement on this. And I have a reputation for getting that done. But actually it's not that complex. If you've got two hours with a bunch of people who don't agree, If you just frustrate them for three quarters of the available time, so for an hour and a half, you just frustrate them. Oh, what do you think? No, what do you think? Oh, that's interesting. Well, you think different. Tell me about that. Oh, what do you think? And at the three quarter mark, if you go to the whiteboard and go, I think I can draw this for you, and you start building a model and you get them to contribute to the model, 30 minutes later, they go, That's the answer. Why didn't you just put that model up at the start? And I go, Well, we. Wow. We hadn't built the model. I, I have it, some some ideas on different places in the world where you can apply that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just a, it's a, it's 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 really magical, and I just, it just became the way I sold to clients. I would draw the model. When you draw, you draw people in, and so I'd be sitting in front of a client, a representative of a company, and I'd draw my way through the conversation. And they would say, can I take a photo of that? And as soon as they've done that, they've bought what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And then they'd usually say, I've got to go back to the company. I've got to talk to the management team and because there's always a second sale that they have to make. And I go, that's fine. But would you like me to come along and I'll walk through the models with them that we've just talked about? And they usually go, yeah, that'd be great. So now I get to get in front of the decision makers. Awesome. And, And it just, so I think it just emerged, I guess, out of, a collection of things. And I assumed everybody worked like that, Eric. I, I, I just assumed for many years that everybody thought and communicated like that. And turns out Obviously that's not, not. the case. <laughs> <laughs> so when is the moment when, when you're thinking, 
huh, actually, I could spend my life teaching th this wow. method. Um, when was the moment we thought, oh, I think I might have a business there? What a great question. So I think I've realized now that, you know, the reason we gather testimonials is not for marketing purposes. The reason we gather testimonials is for, you know, is to build the self-belief in what you do and the power of it. And so I, for as I said, for a long time, I assumed everybody else sold and, and facilitated and communicated in the same way. They must be. Surely this makes so much sense. And there was, uh, I had somebody working with me who was in a lot of my sales meetings and she kept saying, you should teach other people how to sell like this probably for about eight years. And I kept saying, don't be ridiculous. Lots of people sell like this. And um, then one day she said, I'm, I'm going to organise a, a workshop for consultants and I'd love you to come along and teach them how to sell the way you sell. I went, well, I don't think it's going to be a great workshop because half of them will be doing it anyway, but all right. And so, and I didn't have the genius model at that point in time. I was just using a range of models and she, we did the workshop and they were mind blown. And some of them started using the models that I'd put in front of them immediately and immediately started selling off the models. And that's kind of when I thought, oh, hang on a minute. It's not only is it, it it's not just something that I do, but it's something that we can teach successfully to other people that really changes the conversation they have. And then, and then I was doing some work with a not-for-profit that I, uh, some pro bono work for a not-for-profit that I, uh, you know, was very involved with and committed to at the time. And they were having some challenges getting donors. And I said, look, I'll, uh, you know, if we get them in a room, I'll, I'll go through, you know, I'll go through the conversation with them. And I did it with models. It was the international board uh, for um, I mean, children get it, you know, can get a bacteria into the brain and they can die kind of within hours, meningitis. Oh, yeah. It was the, it was the international board for, for meningitis, like the Umbrella Global Organization. And, and the fundamental thing about meningitis is if you can train, particularly in developing countries, if you can train medical practitioners to recognise the signs quickly enough, you can save a lot of kids, right? Wow. And they were, you know, it was always a challenge getting sponsors for them and I gave them a a storyline built in models and they immediately went out and picked up tens of millions of dollars in sponsorship. And I thought, wow, actually, you know, I can really change the language that people use to That's influence. Awesome. That's awesome. And not just in business, but in every dimension. So that's when I started thinking, I, I've got to take this seriously. And it was and then it was not long after that I, I realised well, this is actually my life's work. This is a whole science of its own, this whole models thing. It, you know, there's there's foundation to it, there's psychology behind it, there's a whole lot of research that we've done since. It's a science of its own and because I like research. I don't like guessing at things and I don't like just making stuff up. Um, and I started finding other people that were using models, Charlie, Munga, who, uh, you know, has worked hand in hand with Warren Buffett for many, many years, principally uses models to think quickly. He says there's about 80 major models that you need to know, uh, you know, from an economic and science standpoint. And he uses models as the basis for kind of rapid processing, rapid thinking. The two most important systems for any of us in business, but I think actually in general, is the system for thinking and the system for influence. And yet we don't think of them as systems. We think of the finance system, the delivery system, the marketing system, the sales system. But the two most important systems in business and in, uh, you know, achievement is the system for thinking and the system for influence. So, you know, a business or a charity or even a military um, incursion or an athletic or team campaign is only as good as the idea on which it's built and the quality of thinking that the leaders bring to the table. And then, uh, you know, the ability to influence other people to make choices in your favour, staff to work hard, suppliers to serve you, customers to buy from you, 
um, funding bodies to, to finance you, legislative bodies to give you the licence to operate. If, if, you, if you can really think your way through something powerfully and then influence others to support you, just about everything else takes care of itself. And I started realising no one was actually looking at that as a system and then it hit me one day, models are actually that system. So the, the first thing a great model does is it causes you to really think through something in a highly structured way, but it doesn't shut down creativity. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing it does is it, it, it automatically produces this thing that you can use to influence other people and explain it to them. So, you know, it, I thought I, I realised that's, that's the life's work, you know, and it, it probably over about a 10-year period, you know, I certainly didn't leave school thinking oh, I'm going I'm I'm I'm, hey. I'm going to do I'm going to do models. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now so how many years have you have you uh have you been teaching that now? Um I've been using models professionally as a consultant uh for 25 years. We've been teaching it now for probably the last like really deliberately teaching it as a methodology for the last 10 years. Yeah. Fascinating, and and also the number of people you've you've influenced, and yeah. different countries. So, you know, one of the challenge that um, people in the meetings and event industry have is there's two. First one is what is it exactly that you're doing, and the yeah. second one is to avoid commoditization. And yeah. the way I, I believe the way we we portray ourselves, the way we ask question uh, to the people in front of us and to the prospective uh, customer has a lot of influence on how they are perceiving us yeah. uh, in terms of being a strategic partner instead of just uh, somebody taking care of logistics. Yeah. And wh- one yeah. of the, sorry, go ahead. Go on. No, no, you go ahead. Oh, yeah. One of the, the, the point you, you made to me uh, earlier on was uh, that buyer safety is the new yeah. foundation of high level sales. And yeah. I think that that could relate a lot to, uh, again, people in our industry uh, that are looking into the future, uh, how to uh, operate differently at a higher yeah. level and being able to invoice for what they're worth and not only for their time. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting. The, the pandemic and 2020 has created some interesting shifts in buyer behavior. And um, is it okay if I draw? Oh yeah, I mean that obviously for the podcast people would not see so but they will hear you. Uh yeah. those watching um the uh the channel on the Business of Meetings podcast and even Business Formula on YouTube will benefit from the draw so. Uh, yeah. Th- there's no model quite, to 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 uh explain to people <laughs> only with well, audio but I'm sure you're going to do it. It's interesting. I uh, I'll I'll also explain the model uh, uh verbally as I'm going through. But um you know, it's and and you know, as as people get better and better with models, you can sell with models over the phone, and you just have the customer draw it at their end. It's even more powerful because they're actually drawing the model kinesthetically, and and you're just walking them through it. Wow. It's quite fascinating. But um, th- this, you know, in, th- there's two things I really want to share about this bio safety thing because it really is the thing that I am most focused on right now. So. Uh, 2020 hit, and if we think about a, a continuum from uh, boom on one side of a, of a continuum on the right-hand side to, and we call that green, to bust on the left-hand side and, uh, and a dividing line down the middle. On the boom side of that dividing line, people will buy People will pay for big ideas. People will pay for strategic uh, improvements, for longer-term solutions and things like that. Uh, and it's, it's you know, basically the sale is made on aspiration. On the bust side, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, people aren't paying for big ideas. They're paying for prescriptions, uh, you know, they've got a headache and I need a pill right now. And it's not about aspiration, it's about survival. And so in, in a heartbeat, the pandemic hit 
and we we moved from being towards the boom side to being actually right down the far end of the bust side. And that that shifted buyer behaviour quite dramatically. Um, and it, it highlighted a few things for people. So if we think of business as two as two dimensions, basically, uh, on one side, uh, so if we kind of have a circle with a line vertically down the middle, uh, on the left-hand side of that circle, the left half is sales. The first job of business is to make a sale. And, uh, you know, without a sale, there's no business to be had. Right. On the other side of the circle, on the right-hand side of the circle, is delivery. If we don't deliver value, uh, the, you know, the, the business won't survive either. So <clears throat> on, the, on the deliver side, there's four levels of delivery. At one level, which is the lowest level, we could disappoint people. And there's a lot of customer service and delivery that disappoints. At the next level, we we just do what is promised. We deliver what was asked for. And that doesn't excite people either. Uh, at the next level up, so now we're three levels up, um, we delight the customer, which is pretty good. And there's been a lot of customer service work, uh, you know, on uh, creating you know, customer delight. But I think there's a fourth level. I think those three levels delight the customer, deliver the promise, and at least try not to disappoint them. They're what they're below what I would call in Australian terms the I should bloody hope so line. <laughs> the I hope so. <laughs> say that again. I, the I should the I should bloody hope so line. <laughs> okay. So you know in Australia we don't say damn well, we say bloody, right? Right. I should bloody hope so. So, hey, we won't disappoint you. We'll promise what we, we'll, we'll deliver what we promised and we'll delight you. Well, I should bloody hope so. I certainly haven't bought from you to be disappointed and leave without some level of delight, right? Yeah. It's, you don't get props. You don't get bonuses from me from doing that. It's like, come to the restaurant. We'll give you good food and great service. I should bloody hope so. Yeah. I haven't come for bad service and rubbish food, you know. There needs to be something better. And I think the highest level of customer service is to defend the customer people people want to buy from a hero and they want to be defended people want strength people when people are buying something from someone they want to know you're going to be there for them if they've got a complaint or something doesn't work that you'll defend their right to expect that things should have worked out uh, and even if they're wrong on what they're asking for, they they want to know that you'll defend their dignity at least. Right. You know, we don't need to attack a customer's dignity because they're complaining about what we do, but it happens. So on the delivery side, people want to be defended. And yet so few companies get to that level. On the sales side, at the lowest level, we see people selling on price alone. Hey, buy from us, we're the cheapest. If you find a better price than ours, tell us and we'll match it and we'll beat it by 5%. It's a race to the bottom and it's commoditized. Yeah. Uh, so when people um, when people uh, don't want to sell on price, they move to the next level and they sell on pressure. So false urgency and scarcity. Uh, this is only available until the next break in the conference. And if you don't buy it here, you can't buy it. That's not true. If I offer you twice the price that you're asking today in mm. three weeks' time, will you sell it to me? Well, yes, under those circumstances we would. Well, then this urgency and scarcity is false. But, you know, the, 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 the main thrust of selling for the last 100 years has been pressure-based, 101 closing techniques, you mm -hmm. know? Yes, yeah, um, is it linked to scarcity or is scarcity different? I think it's linked to a scarcity mentality by the seller, mm. but not real scarcity. And I'll, I'll draw another picture for that in a minute. And then we moved into this whole solution-based selling, consultative selling, ask the customer questions, put, you know, put real value in front of them. And even the perception of value has changed with 2020. 
you know, once upon a time we had the value stack, like the bonuses. You can you know, buy this and you'll get steak knives with it. Yeah, kind and of all thing. the bonuses and everything. Yeah, and make the bonus the product, right? 2020 hit, the pandemic hit, and people instantly realized, saw through that. People instantly went, but I don't want the bonuses. I want the thing I'm buying. And I know I must be paying more because of those bonuses. And so people moved from perceived value. Remember, you know, we've all heard the term perceived value, add bonuses. There's a fundamental problem with the idea of perceived value. What is it? It should be real value. Okay, yeah. And so what's happened in 2020 is people have shifted from perceived value to I want profound value. I want deep profound value based on wisdom i actually want someone to show up and make me safe this idea of bio safety emerged for me because solutions and pressure and price are below the i should bloody hope so line you know we we offer a fair price well i should bloody hope so i hope you're not price gouging me right um you know we've got a great solution well i should bloody hope so but we will. But he, and 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 the and the comment I would say to people is, you know, when when people are when people are moving into the unknown, they instantly start feeling unsafe. They're looking for something to protect them. They want to be defended, and they need a map to be able to negotiate the terrain. And every purchase, every purchase for a customer is them moving into the unknown at some level. So even if they're buying a product they understand well, um, a meal in a restaurant, the unknown is what's the service going to be like? What's the actual preparation of the meal going to be? What's happening in the kitchen? <laughs> you know, That's exactly what kitchen. I was thinking because yeah. of, of the noise, which hopefully you didn't hear. I was what's going on in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Every time someone's buying something, they're moving into the unknown and we've got to give them a map. They have to feel safe and they have to feel defended. So the customer during the buying process, and it's interesting, Eric, uh, some research from CEG, um, CEB Global, which are now owned by Gallup, but one of the largest sales research organisations in the world, tells us that if we think about just customer loyalty, 53% of a customer's loyalty is formed during the buying process, not, wow. not yeah, wow. while they're buying. Wow. They're forming their view of you and how loyal they're going to be to you while they're buying from you, not once they've committed and now they're getting the product delivered. So the more you sell on the safety level instead of price, pressure, or solution, yes. the better you, you can hope about the loyalty of the customer. Of, of course. So your customer should feel safer with you than they do without you. Let me say that again. Your customer should feel safer with you than they do without you. Your buyer should feel safer with you than they do without you so that they reach a point where the safest thing for them to do is to mm. commit and buy from you. And, and so how do, you know, if you think about the average sales process, it's a fundamentally unsafe process for the buyer. And the safety is challenged when they get into the first live conversation with a human, with another human. So my, my youngest daughter is 25 now, and she wanted to have her own private health insurance. It was time. And she went onto a website in Australia, which is like a price comparison website called Mia Cats. And they have all sorts of private health insurance. And she's just, you had to, you know, you had to put your name and email, you had to put your name, email and mobile phone number in there to kind of get into the website and start looking around. And she's kind of looking around the website and all of a sudden her mobile phone rings. And she answers the phone and some guy introduces himself and says, hi, I'm Fred from Meerkats. I noticed that you're on our website looking at private health insurance and um, I just thought I'd ring to see if I could help you. You know, what are you looking for? And she's going, I'm just, I'm just kind of looking around at the moment. He goes, okay, but, you know, what was the last thing you went to hospital for? Maybe I could help you identify the right policy. 
And she's going, no, dude, I just want to, I'm just looking around. And uh, he said, well, let me walk you. And she said, look, just thanks, leave it, right? Yeah. Well, if you do, you know, want help, you can call me back on this number. She came out of her room and said the weirdest thing just happened. And I said, what are you going to She said, I'm never going back to that website again. Because mm. safety was breached. Yeah. That you know they've got this idea in their head that if they jump on the phone and have a conversation, that's pressure. So sorry, pressure. but I can I cannot help but thinking about when you are speaking about something, and suddenly on your Facebook feed there's yep. an ad about something that showed up. Yeah, that's they're watching us. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> and and the thing about it is, you know, no one no one likes to buy under pressure. I'll show that really clearly in a minute. But, you know, companies have this idea that if we jump on the phone and talk you through it, we'll make the sale. But what it did was it pushed her away. Pressure pushes people away. And so that picking the right time to introduce the client into a safe conversation with a real human who's going to make a sale to them is critical. Marketing is all about letting the customer know about you while they have the safety of anonymity, you don't know that they exist and they feel completely safe and they can still find out all about you. So, you know, make sure LinkedIn is on point. Make sure your website's right. Make sure any social media is right. Uh, you know, make sure your online reputations are right because they want to look around with the safety of anonymity. And if they feel safe with you as a result of that, they'll raise their hand and say, I'd like to know more, but they'll usually do it in a way that allows them to have the safety of numbers. Remember the kids that sit at the back of the class, they don't want to be down the front. You know, we want, we want to be in groups. And so safety of numbers means they'll want to come to a webinar that you're running, that, you know, they'll opt in to a, a lead magnet or a PDF that you can send them because it's kind of, I know I'm, I know I'm going onto your list, your marketing list, your, the, the, where you now know my name and my email address, but you've probably got thousands on your list, so you're not really going to notice me. So I have safety of numbers, and so I'll, I'll download your lead magnet or I'll come to your webinar or whatever. And then if that makes sense and and, and I still feel safe, I'll, I'll stick my hand up individually so you notice me. But I want the safety of convenience. I'd like to be able to just maybe book a call without speaking to a person. You know, is there a diary system that allows me to book a call and because I can always cancel that if I don't feel good about things and I'll book a call and see what happens in your process beyond that. And uh, so I, I kind of book this call. I haven't spoken to a human yet. And, and then as soon as I book a call, someone jumps on the phone and says, hey, thanks for booking the call. Uh, now let's make sure you come to the call well equipped and, and all of a sudden I don't feel safe. And I'm going, you know what, don't worry, I'll cancel and I get out. Or I book the call and, and I get a nice email that says, thanks very much, my name's, uh, my name's Joanne, and it's clear this is a real human. Is that okay? Uh, it's not video? an automated system. Is a video but, okay in that case? Uh, video, video is fine. Video is a remote communication. because uh, so, so they get an email from someone who says, hey, is exactly what I was going to say. Be, you know, before you have the call, so that we can really focus on you, here's some things that might be useful for you to know. And it could be a little video page, two or three minutes, right? Because they can watch that over and over again with the safety of privacy. Mm. They can watch this extra information that you provide them within their own home and they can watch it over and over again and equip themselves to come to the call fully informed. Transparency is the number one currency of buyer safety. And so they come to the call fully informed and now they're having a conversation with a real person. And the real person says, did you get a chance to watch the video so that you know a whole lot more about what we do uh, in order, you know, hopefully that'll help you make a decision. We're not going to hide the fact that you're in a sales process, but we want to pace it so that by the time you talk to a human, which is where pressure starts to rise, there, you're already at a point where you, you, you kind of know that actually the safest thing for me to do is actually buy from you. And because if, if I buy from you, I know you're going to defend me. Mm -hmm on the other side when you're delivering to me. And so the sales conversation is wildly different, wildly different. Yeah, and, yeah. In uh, that case, you, you, you're not a commodity. 
far from a commodity, right? right? And so the remainder of these numbers, by the way, 53% of a customer's loyalty is built through the experience they have while they're buying from you. 9% comes from price and 19% comes from brand value and 19% comes from uh, how you deliver quality and service. So how we sell really matters and it just makes sense. We all need to feel safe first. And when we're making a sale, we're asking the customer is walking into the unknown and uh, it's kind of like saying, imagine there's a dark forest and you're standing at the edge of the forest with a customer and you're saying to them, I've got something fantastic for you in the forest. Follow me. <laughs> and, you, and you know the forest really well. So you head off without a torch and you just start walking through the forest and you say, follow me. The customer's going to go, ah, no. I'm not sure. I think I'll stay here, right? Or you're standing on the edge of the forest with them and you say, there's something wonderful in that forest. It's dark, I know, and it's nighttime, I know. But what I've got is a, is a floodlight and I'll shine it into the forest while we both stand here so you can see everything in there. But also what we've done is created a safe walking path through the forest to this magical, wonderful thing in the forest. And we've also lit the magical, wonderful thing up a little bit so you can see it anyway in the, in the distance. And um, we've got, we've got um, you know, we've got protection all the way along that pathway that we've created so that, you know, that no animals or anything can get to us. See the pathway? I'm going to shine my spotlight on it for you. My, um, do you do, I'll walk with you and let's go and have a look at this thing. And they might go, okay, well, that, that sounds interesting. Is it safe? Absolutely. You know, we've got guards along the way. You know, let me introduce you to some of them. Let me explain it to you. And here's some video of other people going there as well. You know, transparency. I'm trying to relate what you're saying now to, to business owners in the meetings and event industry. And I think that the challenge that we've had so far, uh, besides being commoditized, is that we don't want to think too much. We want uh, a blueprint or, or just, you know, we just fill in the box and that's ready. Yeah. Uh, what I love with your approach is that it allows anybody to differentiate themselves, yep. to explain what they're doing, to already build a relationship in, in the, uh, the sales process. And it means that you also have to think a little bit uh, how you're going to apply the, the model to Correct. your business. Yeah. So the real work of the models is the thinking to build the model. And so we, we know that most companies have a genius. You know, if you think of what a company does it, in terms of the company genius, and um, I, I built this model that I call the origins of genius, which is a triangle. And on one side of the triangle uh, is, the, uh, is the founder of the business. And this is the who. You know, who, who did this genius come from that this company is now built on? You know, every great company in the world is built on a person's genius. Bill Gates and Microsoft, Apple and Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Simon um, Bowen and the Models Method. <laughs> models Method. So, you know, the, the, the shipping company that I, that I have done so much work with went from $5 billion to $51 billion in market cap, uh, you know, as we built their genius model. You started what and you went... To Five. five billion to 51 billion. They, they build high-speed commercial ferries and then they got into Navy shipbuilding, currently building about 15% of the US Navy fleet, an Australian company. Um, but the owner, the founder, the original founder, they're a public company now, as a 14-year-old, you know, got a bathtub and put an outboard motor on it and sealed up the plug hole and drove it out into Coburn Sound here in Perth, which, which is the major shipping lane. And so... You know, so much of a, a company's genius is based on the founder, and there's three aspects to that. Uh, the founder's philosophy about what it is that you do. And so if, if you talk to somebody, I, I have a client who's a financial advisor, and he, he has a, a singular philosophy that people that head into retirement, 
just simply do not need to be exposed to risk of financial markets collapsing. Mm. And so he's built his whole business around that single fundamental philosophy. And then the second aspect of the founders, um, what the founder contributes to genius is what we might call their history. But really it's their high story. It's, it's what they've learned from their wins and the lessons from the losses. So that particular financial planner, as the eldest in his family, had done the financial planning for his parents, and then in 2008 they lost half their money. So his history caused him to search for ways to make sure what are the lessons that no financial planner, uh, that no no retiree should lose their money through the collapse of the financial markets, and he's got a system. And so then the, the founder applies their experience and expertise you know the study and just the you know the the the, the stuff learnt on the street uh, to to bring this genius to the table, and then that usually grows and staff get involved and everything else. And so the second side of the triangle uh, is is the idea, it's uh, it's the solution that we bring to the table, and this is the what, and this is all about context. A solution at any level, value at any level, is only as good as the context it serves. Context gives everything meaning. So, you know, if I showed you a, a, a photo of the back of a male bald head, the back of a male bald head, there's three possible contexts for that bald head, and each one of those contexts will elicit a different response. One is he's a skinhead. You know, he's in a gang. He's a skinhead. Right. The other one is he's a Marine. The other one is he's a cancer survivor. Hmm. The context gives the, you know, gives the behaviour meaning, gives everything meaning. And so value is only value in the context of what it serves. And then it's the concept. What's the big idea behind it? And 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 then what specific transformational results does it deliver to clients? And the first thing that's usually lost in a sale conversation is the context. The first thing that salespeople usually walk away from too quickly is the context. Why would you do this? And what's our big concept? Mm -hmm. Then the third side of this origins of genius um, is the delivery of it, which is the how. How do we bring this to the table? And there's three aspects to that. Uh, ease, how easy is it? Speed, how quickly does it happen? And then the third one is for the company, leverage. How leveraged is it from a profitability point of view? Now, what happens for most people, I call this company genius. What happens for most people is it's not organised because the founder never actually pulled their philosophy, their history and their expertise together. And so the founder side of it, where it all originated, is often just left to intuition, intuition, intuitive genius. And as soon as the founder is no longer selling, no one else ever sells as well as the founder does because the founder always had that intuitive genius based on their philosophy, their history, their expertise. The founder also had the licence to make whatever deals they wanted to make to get the sale closed, <laughs> and the salesperson doesn't. So as soon as that intuitive genius from the founder is no longer in the business because the founders left the business, they're old, they've retired or whatever, things start to fall apart. And so we've got this intuitive genius that no one can explain. And so people say, I can't explain what I do. It's amazing. It's magical. It's like this wonderful thing in the middle of the forest. If only I could get people there, yeah. right? And you don't grow and, like that. And they don't grow like that because it's intuitive. And so all we do when we build models, particularly the genius model, is we take this intuitive genius and we organise it. And awesome. the moment you've got organised genius that you can show people, not tell them, but actually show them, give them a blueprint for the brain that says here's how the genius of our company is organised. Here's our philosophy, the history and the expertise that this is drawn from. 
Here's the context it serves, the concept of our big idea and the results we get. And here's how we deliver that with ease, speed, and in a leveraged way. When you can show that to people, you know, magical, magical things happen. It's, awesome. it's and we, you know, I spend 100% of my time taking the intuitive genius of, of a company and organising it into a framework, a model that can be drawn, that can explain it for people. So it's... So when would you say is the right time for a business owner to start thinking about this type of uh, model, to, to put it on paper? Um, obviously, uh, startup level is, is a different phase or when you already have... Uh, in, where you're in business for several years or you have a team, when is actually the ideal moment to spend time on developing uh, your model? Yeah. What your question is really asking, right, is when is it the right time for a business owner to think deeply and profoundly about the compelling, self-evident and transformational value they bring to the marketplace? Exactly. And the reality is, Most people have never actually done that. It's true. And so I work with people who say, it happened this week. I'm working one-to-one with a client this week. She, you know, she's a CFO, a chief financial officer, and she provides those services. She said, I've been trying to explain what I do for 25 years and I've never been, but now I do. Uh, you know, I work with people who've written a book about what they do. Mm -hmm. And then we build their genius model and they go, I've got to rewrite the book. <laughs> you know, I've, When we work with people to build their genius model, they invariably reach a point in the process where they go, we've just dramatically increased the value of what we do because we've got a whole bunch of additional value that's come out of this conversation that we can put on the table that we hadn't seen before because the process of walking through the building of a model opens up lines of thinking that you never saw before because, you know, the, the, it's like a storyboard. You know, one part leads to the other part. If I if I drew a triangle uh, with three, obviously with three sides and said, hey, Eric, let's try and map the origins of genius for a company. I think the first side is the founder, you know, who it comes from, but I don't know what the other two sides are. Now you and I are working together, but still creatively to identify what the remainder of this model looks like. Right. But we're doing creative thinking inside a framework. Yeah. And uh, one of the problems with pure you know, unguided creative thinking is it goes off on all these tangents and that doesn't necessarily translate into value. It translates into discovery and then discovery still needs to be brought back to value. So, you know, the right time to be thinking deeply and profoundly about the compelling self-evident and transformational value of a business that you're going to bring to market is during startup. But most businesses started because the, the founder had a problem You know, here's how most tech companies start or, or SaaS companies. The founder had a problem in their own business or in their own life. And so they, they, they kind of found a way to actually keep solving that problem in a repeatable way. And then they wanted to make that easy and so they made a few spreadsheets. And then they wanted to connect the spreadsheets together so that they you know, a single point of data entry and it would talk to another spreadsheet. And then they thought, if only I could get that spreadsheet as a form on a website so I didn't have to go into the spreadsheet to enter some data into it. And then I thought, well, if I could connect that to another website with an API or something so that it actually updated that website when I put the data into the form that went into my spreadsheet, gee, with those spreadsheets, I could make some amazing reports. I'll, I'll create some reports out of those spreadsheets gee, those reports would make a fabulous dashboard. I'll make a dashboard, which is another spreadsheet just with graphs on it and, and, I know and a pie company charts like and that. tables. I know and, company. and then they look and they go, this is amazing. Everybody would love this. Yeah. I'm going to turn this into a SaaS platform. Right. Which is a completely different game now because now it's a few million dollars to do the programming work and beta testing and bug fixing and thousands of customers who all have individual needs, who, who, who are going to do their best to break your SaaS platform. Yep. And who, who ever said it was commercially viable anyway? But that's how most businesses start, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so many people go into coaching 
for example, coaching is the boom industry of the world at the moment. So many people go into coaching, but they can't sell. They can't market. It, you know, a business can only scale when you can sell, when you can scale the selling. Right. You're overcapitalizing if you're spending money on anything else until you can scale the selling. If you scale delivery but you can't scale the selling, you're just overcapitalized. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know how many people have gone into coaching? You know, I'm going to be a life coach. I'm going to be a. I'm going to be a. You know, a team coach, a leadership coach. Or, but I don't know how to sell. They can coach, but they can't commercialize. And so, and a lot of people also head into business as the founder. And I think this is a real problem. Uh, and because I was a teacher, the teaching experience made me realize that your own experience is not a metric that says you can show other people how to do it. It's an entirely different skill set. And so a lot of people go into business based on their own history, assuming that their experience and journey is the same one that everybody else is on and therefore they can fix everybody else's problem. And that is simply not true. So I'll build the business about my experience and my history without going to the expertise part of it and uh, without forming a real strong philosophy about it and build a business that I could commercialise across thousands of people who don't have exactly the same experience as me but could benefit from parts of it. So the time to think deeply and profoundly about the compelling self-evident and transformational value would be at startup. Uh, what we generally find, though, is that most people in startup phase are just trying to survive. Right, and don't take the time, actually, to, to think no. about those important questions. So, yes, I just want to make a sale. So I'll sell whatever someone will buy. And in a heartbeat, you're selling stuff that's got nothing to do with what the business should really be about. So when's the right time? Startup isn't the right time to, well, startup's a great time to model what you do. As long as you know, you know, you understand that that model will probably only last about 12 months. Yeah, I'm going to resume. Yeah. Because the startup phase, we've got a new puppy, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, my goodness. Puppy phase is nothing. You know, we had a very reliable, bulletproof dog that passed away a few weeks ago at 15, but he was mm. really well trained. I haven't had to do any training for 13 and a half years because he's just been super reliable, right? I'm 15 years older and I've got a puppy. Well, it's a really different phase. It's like the first 12 months of business. It's almost manic and mayhem. And we're doing everything that we we're doing everything we can do and need to do, um, you know, to stop him chewing, to get him to sit and do all that sort of stuff. But in about twelve months, none of that will be relevant because he's a different dog. Yeah. The product has matured, and we need a different genius now to carry it forward. So, in the startup phase, what you do in the, the genius in the startup phase is almost always kind of an eighteen to twelve. 24 month exercise and then then people realize what the real genius is and they spend a period of time in proofing it i guess the the best time is is now regardless of where you are if you have you that. are the best uh, and time then is now. You, you you review it um what every year every two years yeah well the, the the moment you draw a model the moment you draw your genius as a model so <laughs> an, there's an interesting thing that happens um, you know, if I draw a, just a two-by-two two matrix, a square divided into four quadrants, and if down the bottom left-hand corner I say that we use language only to communicate with people, down the bottom left-hand corner, that bottom left quadrant, if we're only using language, that bottom left quadrant, uh, the customer says, I hear you, and it's just noise. And the reason for that is only 11% of the information that we bring in from the world around us comes through the auditory channel, through the ears. And when we read words on paper, it's still auditory. We're speaking it to ourselves in our head. So if we can increase visual access, if on the vertical axis of that two-by-two two matrix, I go right to the top, to the top left corner, and we give people visual access to the idea, to the concept of our product or service, uh, that top top left quadrant they say oh i see and it's interesting what we see is always more interesting than what we hear 
because 83% of the information from the world around us comes directly through the optic nerve. Boom. And the eyes are way more emotional than the ears. Um, now, that leaves us a horizontal axis. We've got two qu quadrants on the right-hand side. And this is, kind of, this is probably the real uh, a part of the real difference of models. If we give people across the horizontal, we go over to the right-hand side and we give them structural access, we draw a model that structures and organises the conversation. Now, in that bottom right quadrant where they've got structural access, they say, oh, I get it because I understand the structure and that's believable. And so in this top right quadrant, which is a green zone, uh, they've got visual access, so they're saying, I see. They've got structural access, so they're saying, I get it. This thing that you're talking about, this idea is desirable. This complex idea is desirable. And then the thing that we really did differently is I studied stage magic and comedy uh, and I spent part of my young adult years in musical theatre and I was fascinated by choreography. And so I started structuring choreography, the specific ways to walk through the model in the conversation. So there's no accidents in the order in which I'm walking through this model. It's really deliberate because uh, if we perform the model at eight or above on a performance scale uh, and we do that with choreography, if we have a really deliberate structured way, a lot of people go into, into a sales conversation with no structure for the conversation. But if we, if, we, if we deliver with great choreography, we get into this super green zone right up in the top right corner of the matrix where desirable becomes viable. But the other thing that happens is if you've framed your, your value as a model, your best customers who, who, who can see what you do and who get what you do can feed back on what you do in a much more powerful way. So if you've framed your complex product or service in a model, not only do you continue to iterate the model, but your customers continue to iterate it for you as well. And that is incredibly powerful. Absolutely. So when I mean, you put that, the model in front of them, they go, well, this bit, what about this bit? Could that work like that? And you go, that's a great idea. I'll add to that's it. That's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. L listen, I, I could speak with you and listen to you for hours. <laughs> that, that's amazing. And, and every time I'm, I'm hearing you, and uh, whether it's a webinar or a presentation, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I have uh, no... No words to describe the admiration of, of what you put together. And it's so um, convincing and, and so powerful. Um, where can people find a little bit more about, about you and about uh, what you do? Sure. So at it's modelsmethod.com uh, is our website. Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. I post very, very regularly on LinkedIn. Uh, we've got a bunch of videos and things. Uh, on the website that's interesting for people as well. And uh, one of the things that we often give people, so our primary our primary uh, offer or product is that we, we capture a company's genius into a framework that we call the genius model. And then we craft that into a models-based selling system that brings this buyer safety notion to the table because models are incredibly transparent. When people are, are seeing value expressed through a model, that everything's on display and they feel safer with you. So primarily what we do is we, we capture company genius into a framework, we map it out into a sales system uh, and, and you know, to load buyer safety into that. But, but um, there's a model that we often give people, a bell curve. If I've got just a couple of minutes, um, you know, the bell curve is an incredibly powerful way of, uh, just eliminating lowest price from the conversation before you even talk about it. And um, there's a little there's a little video and a checklist that I can share with you, Eric, that you can um, gift to people. I'm very happy for them to have that. Thank you. Um, but if you think about a bell curve, imagine a conversation with a client and and you want to you're positioned at a premium price, um, and you know that a lot of the market buy at a lower price, or a lot of the market want to push on price because that's their job. They're a customer, right? And so at the start of the sales conversation, 
you do something like this, you draw a bell curve and it's going to be divided into four from left to, from left to right. So you draw a bell curve and you say, look, in, in terms of what we do, um, the bell curve is real like it is in every other kind of area. There are some people that are way over the left-hand side of the bell curve. You know, we think of that as a red zone. These people are providing an, oh, my goodness, kind of solution into the marketplace. It's kind of pretty poor. It's not that great. You know, they're in the market, but, uh, you know, generally it's it's cheap. You know, they're cheap, and that's why people buy it because the product itself is not that great. You know, what would you, let's say, I did this live from stage. I, I said, who wants to sell something at twice the price? And a guy said, I do. I sell training for hospitality. How much, sir? And he said, $2,500 a day. And I said, great. Um, sit down. Is it? Do you do a great job? He said, I, I do an amazing job. Best in the market. I said, great. Sit down. Who wants customer service training? And about 40 people stood up in the room. And so then I went through this. So in terms of customer service training, you know, the bell curve is real. There are people that are providing, oh, my goodness, customer service training. It's pretty poor. But people go there for the lowest price. Hey, folks, what would you expect to pay for that kind of training? And someone said $500 a day. Right? Okay. At the next level, which is kind of yellow zone, uh, and this is the, the, you know, the major kind of middle average part of the bell curve, this is okay customer service training. You know, the, the staff that attend the training will, will tick the happy sheet and say that was fun, but the customers, not so sure if it's going to translate into really uh, significant improvement in, in customer service, but it's okay. What, what would you expect to pay for that? And uh, by the way, if, you're, you know, if you don't want to buy once I get, you know, at the end of this, sit down, but I'm, I'm making a real sale on behalf of Fred. This was all live on stage. What would you expect to pay for that okay level of training? And someone said, oh, up to $1,500. I said, great. At the next level, now this is a smaller percentage of the bell curve, but there are people that are providing customer service training that is wow training, right? And, uh, it, you know, wow training, not only are staff going to be happy, but we're going to, you know, we're going to see some of that translate into happier customers as well. And it's just, it is wow at every level. What would you expect to pay for that? And someone said, I'd pay $5,000 a day for that. I said, great. But you know there's another level, don't you? And they go, what? You know there's another level, don't you? Wow is a narcotic. And when you give someone wow, you need a bigger hit. You give your staff wow training, the next training needs to be better, more wow. And wow is also cosmetic. It's superficial. There's a deeper level up in this dark green zone and a very, uh, there's just a very small percentage of people that manage this. And this is when the training is at the level of, oh, there's two sounds the human body can make without effort and they mean the same thing in every language. The first one is, huh, which means I don't get it. And the second one is, oh, <laughs> which is the sound of deep, profound realisation and change. It's the sound of meditation. Um, it's the central sound of all the great prophets, Allah, Yahweh. It's the sound of deep realisation. When this kind of training is delivered to your staff, of course they're happy, but they're also changed permanently. And so not only are your customers happy, the customers no, there's just something different about your company. So for the people that are standing in the room today and the change in my tone and everything else is choreography, yeah. for the people that are standing up today, there's about 40 of you that said you're in the market for hospitality training. What would you pay for that kind of training? Oh. And someone said priceless. I'd pay. Someone said 10K. Someone said priceless. And I and I said, now, I... I this is a real sale. This is a real sale. Who would, you know, who would like to buy? Fred, do you deliver permanent, profound change to teams? And he said, I do. Right. So, we're make, folks, we're talking about who wants to buy this oh, level of training. Now, if you don't want to buy it, sit down now. 
But if you're still in the game, stay standing. And there were five people stayed stayed standing. And so uh, I said, how many, you know, who would like to buy that oh, level of training at the upper end of the wow price? So who'd like to buy that at $5,000 a day? And two of them said, we will. Mm. And I said, great. Are you serious? Because this is a sale. And they said, yes. So you need to talk to Fred in the break. And Fred, you need to get it set up with them. Then Fred went, yeah, but my daily rate's two and a half thousand dollars a day. I'm going, you just really need to stop talking now, Fred. <laughs> but, but you know, Fred hasn't, but that's a classic case, right? If Fred's got intuitive genius, he's not organized genius. Right. Yeah. He he's not sure in his own mind, right? So this I this 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 um bell curve kind of eliminates cheap early. Because who in the room is going to say, yeah, no, I want to buy at the cheap end? Ego doesn't let people say that once it's in front of them like this. Yeah, absolutely. And it positions the, the you know, the value end very differently. So there's a little video and a little checklist about this bell curve model for price positioning that uh, people can just grab as a link. Um, I, I have a weekly uh, Simon Says email that, that I send out. They'll... You know they'll they'll end up being subscribed to that. Um, so what what is the link to get the the, the video on the pricing? Um, I just let me grab that actually, and I'll put it in the chat. I did. Um, I actually I put it into a form that I sent you. Is it uh, oh. createmymodels.com/eoi? Correct. Okay, so I repeat. Uh, so https uh how do you say double point slash slash but it, the the uh, the url is create my models.com uh forward slash e o i yeah and, if and i'll also by any uh, chance you haven't uh listened to it and um just shoot me an email uh, i'll definitely share that with you it has been absolutely awesome uh, listening to you. Uh, again, I, I've learned a lot. I'm sure that people listening uh, is the same. Um, thank you so much, uh, Simon, for uh, sharing your your uh, your knowledge and and more than that, what you created. It's absolutely uh, amazing. It works. I know a lot of people uh, working with you, and they're all very happy. Uh, and uh, I can wait to uh, even elaborate more. Uh, with you for our, our businesses. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. My pleasure. Really enjoyed uh, our chats even before we started recording. <laughs> right. And I just have such a great memory, Eric, of sitting on a boat with you in Cabo yes. and, and just chatting and things. What a, what a great day that was. So I thank you that, for having me on. It's been a course, pleasure. I would that again very soon, hopefully. Yes. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Simon, for coming on the Business of Meeting podcast. I always learn when I'm listening uh, to you. It's absolutely genius, your genius model and what you've developed. Uh, now for all people listening, I'm sure if you're like me, you have your mind on fire and it's time to apply that to your own business. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn or join us uh, in the private Facebook group, www.evenbusinessformula.com forward slash group. Thank you, and I'll see you on the next episode of the Business of Meaning podcast.